Physics students, welcome to the third and final video for topic 4.3, Wave Characteristics. And in this video, I'm going to talk about polarization and something called Malice's Law, which is related to that, okay? So a definition of this term polarization in physics, what it means is when vibrations, think about waves, are made to occur only in one direction. This is kind of a weird definition until you actually see what I mean, okay? Um, imagine that I send transverse waves vertically down a rope or a string, okay? And in this case, these, these waves are traveling in the positive x direction, okay? These waves are only traveling in one plane, and that's the vertical plane. They're going positive y, negative y, right? So that's in one, only in one direction up and down, okay? Now, if I were to put a, a box with a slit cut through it uh, as such like this, where the slit is parallel to the direction to the displacement, then that wave would go clearly right through that slit, okay? Now, if I had, uh, if I did it horizontally, like on the floor, like that, if I were to put the, the slit horizontal, again, the waves would pass right through unimpeded to the, to the far right um, on the x-axis, okay? Um, now, these, these waves are what we call polarized because they occur only in one direction. Um, you cannot polarize longitudinal waves. The term only really makes sense with transverse waves, okay? Now, if all the vibrations of a transverse wave are in a single plane, which contains the direction of propagation of the wave, the wave is said to be plane polarized, okay? That's the physics term that you need to know. Sometimes you, you hear it linear, linearly polarized, but plane polarized is much more common. So you can see that wave A is plane polarized in the xy plane, and wave b is plane polarized in the xz plane. You see that? Okay. Now, um, let's let's get a little more into this uh, in much more detail, talking about angles. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in the case of a, this wave can pass through this slit without any hindrance as long as the slits have the orientation shown. Okay, where theta is zero, and I'm talking theta is going to be the angle between the blue line and the red line. Okay, now wave B is completely blocked. Okay, so this is the case where you have a vertically oriented wave, say on a rope or a string, and you, in the previous slide, that cardboard box with the slit, you orient it such that the slit is horizontal. You can see that all that energy will get lost, will get, will, will, the wave will smack up against the box, and none of the energy is going to get through. In this case, the angle between the red line and the blue line is pi over 2 radians. Okay, um, in other, way, in, in other words, you could, you could also rotate slit A through pi over 2, or if the, wa if the wave is rotated through pi over 2, either the wave rotated or the, or the actual slit, there is no transmission. Um, if, if, if theta is between 0 and pi over 2, then only part of that wave energy can get through, but not all. So, so the maximum uh, energy would be in case A, the minimum in case B, but the reality is as we change that angle, between 0 and pi over 2, it's going to be some value of energy between these two cases. And only the component of the wave parallel to the slit is transmitted, okay? So here again is yet another example of us having to deal with um, component vectors again, right? Parallel components and so forth, okay? Now, um, to really understand polarization, we have to have a short discussion about light, okay? Now, what is light? What light is, is it's varying electric and magnetic fields Okay, so the electric field vibrates in this particular depiction in the xy plane, B vibrates in the yz plane. Okay, now E and B are in phase with each other. By the way, the B refers to magnetic field, remember that. They're in phase with each other with the phase shift of zero. Okay, the electric field has its maximum value we call E naught, that's the amplitude of that wave. Uh, the magnetic field B has its maximum value B naught, that's the, that's the amplitude of that wave. When light interacts with matter, the electric field dominates the magnetic field. Okay, it's much more dominant in terms of determining what happens in terms of energy and, and wave travel and so forth. Okay, so the plane of polarization, a simplifying assumption we make in this class, very important for you to note this, is that that's the plane which contains the E field because the E field has much more effect on energy and so forth. Okay, so remember, keep in mind that it's an E field and the B field, but when we talk about polarization, we're really talking about that E field as a transverse wave. Okay. Now, most sources of light are unpolarized, okay? They're short bursts of electromagnetic waves emitted by many different atoms, okay? And this means that the electric field directions are perpendicular to the direction of wave travel, but they're distributed all around it randomly, okay? So, and it's actually more than you can possibly show in a diagram, but this is unpolarized light. It's going, it's like fanning out in all directions, right? The, those, it's like an... It, 
almost an infinite number of planes in all directions. When that passes through a polarizer, what comes out the other side is a very nice, just one plane of that electric field uh, transverse wave, okay? We say that it's polarized light, okay? Now, <clears throat> we use what are called polarizing filters to polarize light, okay? And polarizing filters for electromagnetic waves of differing wavelengths have different kinds of construction depending on the application of the filter, okay? You need to know in the IB, you need to understand the term polarizing axis, okay? The polarizing axis is, um, is this axis right here, okay? Theta is the angle between the polarizing axis and the plane of wave propagation, okay? So, um, so again, the polarizing, sorry, the polarizing axis would be this vertical, or I guess if this is the slit right here in this diagram, the polarizing axis will be the axis that's, um, that is parallel to the slit, okay? All right. Now, an example of what a polarizing filter can do. If you're a photographer, uh, you've used polarizing filters. Um, and I'll show you in class how we can actually um, turn two polarizing filters relative to one another and get absolutely no light transmission if they're actually at 90 degrees to one another. Um, polarizing filters, what they can do is they can, they, can, um, they can cut out light that's already polarized in nature. So, for example, down here, you see this is with a polarizing filter. The one on the right is, is not with this pond, okay? It's because when, when incident light from the atmosphere hits a surface of water, that water surface polarizes that light. So if you have a polarizing filter on the end of your camera and it's adjusted just right, you can actually cut out all of that reflected light and you'll actually see underwater. It's super cool, okay? So generalizing, generally, polarizing filters um, deepen contrast, like for example, the clouds here with this church before and after. Um, and they just make, um, they make images crisper with more contrast and actually the colors tend to be deeper. Here's one of a car where we're actually getting rid of the reflected light off the hood, which is polarized, okay? So lots and lots of different applications of polarizing filters, okay? Now, reflective surfaces, as we just saw before with water and the, and the, the hood of the car, can polarize light, okay? Um, when unpolarized light reflects on a non- uh, reflects non-metallic surface, the reflected ray is partially polarized, okay? And remember, um, that surface of the, of the car hood was, was metal, but it's coated with paint, and it's the paint that reflects the light, not the metal underneath it. The plane of polarization is parallel to the reflecting surface. The amount of polarization depends on the angle of incidence. There's also a refracted ray into the water, in the case of water, and the plane containing the incident and reflected rays and the normal of the surface is the, called the plane of incidence. So again, right, a polarizing filter will, will filter out all of the sunlight from these clouds that's reflected off the water, and you'll get a nice crisp image under the water. It's kind of like magic, but it's not really magic. It's physics, right? Okay? Some applications of uh, polarization. I've been talking about photography. Again, reducing glare, bringing out deep colors, increasing contrast, and so forth. Okay? In sunglasses, um, what... If you guys have ever noticed, you, if, if you're out on a sunny day and you're wearing sunglasses and you tilt your head and you look at the sky, the sky gets different um, depths of blue, like a deep blue and a light blue. This is because uh, most, sun, most sunglasses uh, that are worth anything are polarized, okay? And the way they work is they reduce the glare that comes off of like water or a highway or whatever that's horizontally polarized. Um, and usually in sunglasses, the two lenses are polarized and uh, are are oriented at 90 degrees to one another, so that you um, so that you can so that the glasses will work with any polarized light at any orientation that you happen to encounter in nature or wherever else. Okay, pretty cool. Now the glasses I'm wearing right now uh, are not polarized. They're very cheap glasses. Most cheap glasses are not. Uh, you have to get into the range of spending a little bit of money for glasses to get um, to get a, to get polarized glasses, but it's well worth the money if you spend a lot of time outside. Okay. All right. Stress analysis. This is a really cool example application of polarization. Okay. Turns out that some substances, especially plastics, um, become what 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 we call optically active when they're subjected to stress or forces within the, within that material. Okay. And when I say optically active, I'm talking about how the plane of polarization is actually changed, is actually rotated. And the degree of optical activity is proportional to the stress. So the more stress, the greater the, pol the plane of polarization is rotated. If the stress substance is viewed through cross-polarization filters, you'll see colors, right, which remind you of the spectrum, right, 
the, the visible light spectrum. This color pattern can be used to investigate the stress distribution, okay? So it's really useful when you're designing things um, and if you build like a perspex or a plastic model and you want to find out where the weak areas are, okay? So for example, as viewed through polarizing filters, these plastic knives and forks, you can see where there's, there are areas of greater stress in that material, uh, a DVD case, a hook here, and even through an airplane window, okay, which is not made of glass, okay, um, you can see where the, the different um, the different stress areas within the material making up that window, which is a very high grade sort of perspex, uh, really hard plastic. Um, again, these are all viewed through through polarizing filters. If you wear your sunglasses, you notice sometimes you'll see like a rainbow pattern on, on car windows and windshields and things like that. That's the reason why you're able to detect where the where the glass is weaker and stronger. It's pretty cool stuff. Okay. All right. Another another really good application is liquid crystal displays, such as in your calculator. Okay. This is a little more complicated, so I'm just going to blow through this. If you want to find out more about it, you can get on Wikipedia or any other source. Okay. But basically, they're made with um, different layers. Okay. So there's pixels inside your calculator screen, and they have layers of these things called liquid crystal molecules between two electrodes and two perpendicular polarizing filter. With no liquid crystal between the filters, light passing through the first filter would be completely blocked by the second because they're perpendicular, they're at pi over two radians according to one another. Now the electrodes touching the crystal, what they do is they align molecules in a certain direction. There's a voltage applied across the electrodes, or a potential difference, and a torque basically twists these crystal molecules parallel to the resulting electric field um, across the electrodes. The rotation of polarization is therefore reduced and the device appears gray. If there's a high enough voltage, the molecules in the center are almost completely untwisted and the polarization of the incident light is not rotated and therefore the pixel appears black. So you think about the application of this and the fact that someone figured this out, it's astonishing, right? So by controlling voltage applied across the liquid crystal layer in each pixel, light can be allowed to pass through in varying amounts, giving different levels of gray. It's amazing, okay? All right, last thing I want to talk about in this topic, 4.3, is called Malice's Law, okay? It turns out that no matter how the polarizing axis is oriented, the intensity of light on the other side of a polarizing filter um, compared to what it was on the other side, on the original side, is reduced by a factor of one half. This is surprising. You would think it would be much less than one half, right? Um, that's what it is, okay? And it turns out we can do a little more um, in, maybe in class on this. If you resolve the electric field of the incident wave into components parallel and perpendicular to the polarizing axis, the incident light is a random mixture of all states of polarization, and on, a on average, those two components are equal, okay? The polarizer transmits only the component that's parallel to the polarizing axis. So it turns out, and you could actually do calculus to figure this out, uh, though we don't really have to, um, half, only half of the incident light is transmitted. This is very important in solving physics problems, okay? Very important relationship, okay? And that's called Malice's Law, okay? Well, it's leading up to Malice's Law. Now, consider light that's already been polarized and passed through another polarizing filter. If we let E0 equal the E field incident from the first filter, and E is the component of E0 transmitted through the second filter, we'll do examples, okay? Then E equals E0 cosine theta, okay, vector components. And it turns out that intensity is proportional to the square of the magnitude of the electric field, okay? And this is what's called Malice's Law, okay? So I equals I0 cosine squared theta. You do not have to derive this in the IB, but you need to be familiar with it, and it's given to you as a formula in your data booklet, okay? Where I0 is the incident intensity. So you can imagine cases where you would, you would use Malice's Law together with the uh, with with um, i equals one half i naught as i presented in the last slide to solve some problems okay now malice's law only applies if the incident light passing through the analyzer okay which is the second filter is already linearly polarized so again in physics speak the the the, the filter that's the polarizer is the one that initially polarizes the unpolarized incident light, okay? And the analyzer is the one that you would use to, um, to actually apply Malice's law, okay? Polarizer and analyzer. So let's do a few, of exam uh, a few examples. Go ahead and read this uh, on your own, and then I'll show you how to do it. 
So we have polarized light of intensity I0 incident on a polarizer that has a transmission axis of pi over 6 radians to the vertical. The transmitted light is then incident on a second polarizer. Da, 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 da. Okay, calculate the factor by which the transmitted intensity is reduced. Now, you're crazy if you don't draw a diagram. Okay, I don't know how you're going to do these problems if you don't just make a sketch. Okay, so here's a very rudimentary sketch. I have I0 coming through. Okay, um, the, first, uh, the first polarizer is pi over 6, right? Okay, to the vertical. Second is pi over 3 to the vertical. Okay, all right. Maybe not, the, not entirely accurately drawn, but you get the idea. Okay, so I1, which I'm calling the, the intensity between the filters, ends up being three quarters of I0, okay? And I2 ends up being uh, 9 sixteenths of I0, okay? So therefore, it's reduced by a factor of 9 16 from its original, okay? So make sure that you understand this, um, understand this example, right? Because you're going to be dealing with angles that are not right angles all the time in an application of Malice's Law, okay? All right, let's do another example. This is a past paper question. Plane polarized light is incident normally on a polarizer, which is able to rotate in the plane perpendicular to the light as shown. Got it. In diagram one, the intensity of the light, incident light is 8 watts per square meter. Transmitted is 2 watts per square meter. Diagram two shows the polarizer rotated 90 degrees from the orientation in diagram one. Okay. Okay, you get it? What's the new transmitted intensity? You're going to have to pause the video and really study this. There's a trick to doing this problem, and I'll show you. Okay. All right, if in case 1, I equals I naught equals I, okay, then theta would have to equal 0. Then case 2 would have theta equals 90 and I and I would equal 0. Okay, therefore, okay, this is basically a logic exercise. The transmitted intensities of the two cases at 90 degrees or pi over 2 to one another must equal the total incoming radiation. Okay, so therefore, in case 2, it must be the case that the transmitted light okay, has to be 8 minus 2, which is 6 watts per square meter, okay? And I think originally this was a paper 1 question, so you can imagine, you can see you don't need a calculator to do it, um, although you might be lured into thinking that you might get, have to get into Malice's Law and all, this, uh, all these angles and so forth, but you don't have to here, okay? Last example, unpolarized light is shown through two identical polarizers whose axes are parallel. Got it? Determine the ratio I to I naught. Okay, all right, so through 1, I is equal to 1 half I naught, of course. Through 2, none of it is blocked, okay? So therefore, I is going to equal to 1 half, be equal to 1 half I naught, as stated previously, 